During a pandemic, forensic pathologists are closely involved in managing the crisis. Their role is to ensure the proper management of dead bodies, minimizing the spread of the virus, and to guide authorities, hospitals, and funeral directors about, I guess, the do's and don'ts of dealing with these bodies. The question is, how stressful has their job been of late? And perhaps more importantly, do we have enough of these so-called medical detectives to meet our needs? I'm going to talk now to Professor Johan Dempers, who heads the Division of Forensic Medicine and Pathology at Stellenbosch University, also the Western Cape Forensic Pathology Service that's based at the uh, Tigerberg Hospital. Professor, good afternoon to you and welcome. My sense is that the country simply doesn't have enough pathologists. And I think I'm right in saying you were raising this issue three years ago, long before the COVID pandemic. That is correct. Can you hear me? Loud and clear. Go ahead, sir. That, that is correct. And um, Despite the fact that we've escalated this in the past, we still seem to be having the problem. Uh, and, you know, it's just got to do with there not being enough people who actually want to specialize in the field. Um, the problem also is even if we canvass more medical doctors to specialize as forensic pathologists, you don't turn them out uh, after a year. It takes a good four to five years um, after selection and appointment and uh, writing exams that a specialist will be able to work with in forensic medicine. So, Professor, um, what does it mean then if we don't have enough of these specialists? It's very much a linear equation. If we don't have people to de do the autopsies, it means that the people who are there must do more cases. Our unnatural death um, investigation mandate is regulated by the Inquest Act. Um, it's pretty straightforward in that all unnatural deaths need to be uh, medically legally examined and autopsies need to be done in the vast majority of them. We cannot compromise on the legal process. We cannot not do cases, not examine cases. And then if we are only a handful, it means that all the cases that have to be done need to be done by those pathologists to work in the field. Um, in the past, we used to, the, uh, there was a, um, a study done to look at how many forensic pathologists are required to do the caseload in South Africa. And I think the figure was somewhere just a bit over 250. Last we checked, there was about 60 registered forensic pathologists in the country. So it, it would give the public an idea of how far we are behind in terms of hands-on tech to do these cases. And just to give us a sense, aside from the numbers of pathologists that, uh, that are currently working, there are also recommendations, I understand, on the effective and efficient number of autopsies that a pathologist uh, should be doing. And my understanding is that whatever that figure is, ours are doing double that. That is correct. So we, we um, lean very heavily on the international recommendations. So the National Association of Medical Examiners in the U.S. recommends that a registrar or person in training should not do more than 250 cases under direct supervision uh, annually. We looked at those figures. We realized it's absolutely futile to try to get it down to that amount. It would mean that we would physically have to not do cases, not perform autopsies. So we set the standard in South Africa for 350, which we thought was doable. Um, I've got staff members who are performing 450, 500, sometimes in excess of 500 cases a year. I'm absolutely convinced that they're all dedica dedicated to their jobs, but if that caseload is as it exists at the moment or possibly increases, one imagines there is a propensity for error. If that's the case, what does that mean? It's undeniable that if you just pile the work on, errors creep in. And we, um, we employ what we think to be quite um, an extensive set of, of uh, checks and balances to try to minimize the errors. Uh, inevitably, one will have to have, you know, concede that there may be errors made. We also try to then uh, decrease or minimize, you know, the, the output in some areas to actually not have the errors. So if we have a case where it's not a priority for the court. Uh, you know, we, we try to give provisional feedback to families, but that case is not going to perhaps be completed, um, you know, in the recommended amount of time, three days turnaround time, uh, because we need to, um, you know, get the priority cases out. We have very close relationships with um, an affiliation with the National Prosecuting Authority, so they indicate to us the cases that are on the court rolls so that we can at least try to streamline our service in such a way that we meet those requirements, um, that we do what we wanted to do from the start, and that's to assist to serve justice. So the upshot here is this has a direct impact on the solving of cases and prosecutions. So we, we, we want to believe that it doesn't necessarily because we are prioritizing those, those cases. 
if we were to prioritize every single case as we, you know, as we have to, I suppose, then inevitably there would be uh, the potential for error in some of these cases. So we, we're happy with the compromise that we are making in terms of that not actually, um, you know, um, uh, resulting in major errors in court. Thank you for joining me. Professor Johan Demper is head of the uh, Division of Forensic Medicine and Pathology at uh, Stellenbosch University and also the Western Cape Forensic Pathology Service at uh, Tigerberg Hospital. Um,